Without any further ado, inshallah ta'ala, let's go into today's lesson. In Surah Al-Furqan, towards the end of the surah, Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions um, a characteristic of a particular group of people. Allah, He calls them Ibad Ar-Rahman. Ibad Ar-Rahman. The slaves of Ar-Rahman. Okay? The slaves of Ar-Rahman. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions something powerful about these people. At the end, when He describes them with eight characteristics, Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ يُجْزَوْنَ الْغُرْفَةَ بِمَا صَبَرُوا These are the people who they are going to be rewarded with big chambers and places to live inside of Jannah. بِمَا صَبَرُوا Okay? Because of their patience. Because they had sabr. وَيُلَقَّوْنَ فِيهَا تَحِيَّةً وَسَلَامًا And therein, when they're inside of these houses, inside of Jannah, inside of these rooms, inside of these chambers in paradise, they shall be met with greetings. They'll be given greetings. And words of peace and respect. Salam, salam, salam. Does that make sense? So these are people who are going to get a one-way ticket entry into Al-Jannah. So a person should want to be from this group of people who Allah referred to as his personal slaves. Ibadur Rahman. He said, these are my slaves. Is everyone a slave of Allah? Is everyone a slave of Allah? We all say Allah. Even the Kafir, the Mushrik, the atheist is a slave of Allah Azza wa Jal. Like in Allah went out of the way to say to these people, they are my slaves. Does that make sense? They are what? They are my slaves. And we know that when Allah attributes something to himself, he does it to honor it. For example, the masjid that we're in right now, Dar al-Salaam masjid here, right now, the masjid we're in. Is this masjid a house of Allah? It is. But when I say Baytullah, the house of Allah, do you think of Dar al-Salaam masjid? Or do you think of any other masjid except for the one masjid? Which is what? The Shahar Mecca. Because to honor it, it was referred to as Baytullah, the house of Allah. Does that make sense? Because of how great it is in comparison to all of the other masajid. So these people are slaves of Allah, just like we are all slaves of Allah. But Allah said they are Ibadur Rahman. They are the slaves of Ar Rahman. He connected his own name to them. The same way, Rasulullah. If I, if I tell you, hey, go communicate this message for me to your family, are you a messenger? You are. But you're not Rasulullah. The Messenger of Allah, he has the honor of his name connected to the name of Allah in describing him. That when you describe Muhammad Sallallahu you describe him with Allah's name. When you describe the house in Mecca, the Kaaba, you describe it with Allah's name, Baytullah. When you describe these slaves, Allah, he himself describes them with his own name. And he doesn't just use any name. He uses what? Rahman. Ar-Rahman. It's one of the most beautiful names of Allah Azza wa Jal. It's his name that describes his mercy it describes his love and affection that he has for his creation and that's why these people are honored purely just by the title just by the fact that you know that they are called ibad rahman is enough for you to say i want to be a part of these people how do i get inside of this group does that make sense and then of course that they're going to have a agenda that's even a step higher does that make sense so now it's important to mention and to know that the slaves of allah are two types the slaves of Allah Azza wa Jal are, they are two types, okay? They are the slaves that are slaves by necessity. al ubudiyah al ibtirar We call this slavery by necessity. You are forced to be a slave whether you like it or not. And this is like in the Quran when Allah Azza wa Jal said, In kullu man fi samawati wal ardi illa aati rahmani abada. Allah Azza wa Jalla said there is not a single person in the heavens and the earth except they will come to Ar-Rahman as a slave. They will come to Ar-Rahman as a slave. A person will say, how? How? How is the Christian a slave of Allah when he worships Jesus? How is an atheist a slave of Allah when the atheist doesn't even believe Allah exists, let alone worship him? How? Ibn Amal explained in many ways. Number one, number one, the fact that every single human being, animal, every creature knows that Allah Azza wa Jal exists. Even the atheist knows that Allah exists. They will tell you, what? When you ask them, who created the heavens and the earth? Who created the universe? If you keep asking them, where did that come from? Where did that come from? They will say, the answer is one big elite mother universe. So when you ask them, describe this mother universe. It's the all-powerful, all-sustaining, the beginning, the end. Basically, you just described Allah, Al-Qawi, 
القادر الرزاق الأول والآخر but they just want to run away from saying it's Allah does that make sense? the Christian knows Allah exists the Hindu knows Allah exists everyone deep down they know and they believe that Allah Azza wa Jal exists and he created them even the Quraysh who used to worship other idols Allah said in the Quran if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth فسيقولون Allah who provides from the heavens and the earth فسيقولون Allah they will say Allah does so this is one of the ways that everyone is a slave of Allah because they can't run away from the fact that they know that Allah created them and there are other ways that a person is a slave of Allah as well does that make sense? but that's the type of slavery that everyone has and that's not the type of slavery that Allah is talking about here in Surah Al-Furqan. This is the second type of slavery, which is called Ubudiya Al-Ikhtiyar. Okay? Ubudiya Al-Ikhtiyar, which is that you chose to be a slave. Everyone else was forced to be a slave to some extent, but you chose to become even more submissive. You actually said, Allah, I'm going to surrender myself to you. I lift my hands up. You make dua, what are you doing? You're begging. We're begging, right? When you do ruku, what do you do? This is surrender. Imam Ibn Qayyim, he said, you know, when, 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 when you do the takbir of salah, Allahu Akbar, you do that. He said, one of the things that this signifies is surrender, because when you're at war and someone, he points an arrow or a sword at you, what do you do? I give up. I surrender to you. Does that make sense? So Ibn Qayyim said, this is one of the wisdoms behind this action, and there's others as well. For example, it's like signifying that you're tossing the world over your shoulders. The whole world, I've tossed it over my shoulders, Allah, because I've gone into salah, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater than everything else, and I've tossed the world behind me. Another way he says, you've surrendered. So you surrendered to Allah, Azza wa Jal. Chose, you willingly chose to do that, right? This is the slave that Allah praises. This is the one that's been spoken about here. The one who chose, he said, Allah, I want to be your slave. I choose to be your slave. Tell me, where's the checklist to be your slave? I'm going to do it. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? And also before we go, into these characteristics it's important to mention that there are eight characteristics that they have but before the eight characteristics were mentioned there was one unique thing about them that was mentioned which was that they were slaves which shows you that all of these characteristics mean nothing if you don't come with Tawheed al-Udiyah the Tawheed of slavery the Tawheed of servitude the Tawheed of worshipping Allah Azza wa alone when a person comes with Tawheed al-Udiyah he's worshipping Allah he's free from shirk and then he works on these eight then that's it, he's a slave of Ar-Rahman. Does that make sense? But it starts with At-Tawheed. Now without any further ado, inshallah ta'ala, let's go into it. The first characteristic that Allah he describes, the first thing he says about them, he says, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا The first thing Allah says about them, the first thing, he mentions two points. The first thing Allah says, He mentions two points. And you should be writing this down. If you've got your phones, write it down. Take notes on your phone. Because you want to be from these people. Does that make sense? So Allah said, the first thing, they do, the, first, the first category, they do two things. يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ حَوْنَا When they walk on the earth, they walk humble. They don't walk that they think that they're a big man. They don't walk with their trousers sagging, bumping across the road. They don't walk like they own the place. They walk humble. يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا Not just that. وَإِذَا They're so humble. They're so humble. But وَإِذَا خَابَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ If a person is jahil, ignorant, he talks to them, insults them, argues, debates, funny with them, قَالُوا سَلَامًا They just respond with words of peace. They don't engage in, they don't get into an argument. They don't start fighting the guy. Does that make sense? Let's go into the ayah. Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned something powerful. He mentioned that the, that, the, that the sins and the wrongdoings that come from the slaves of Allah, they happen because of two things. They happen because of their feet and where they walk to, and their tongue and what they say with the tongue. So if a person fixes his feet and where he walks and how he walks, and he fixes his tongue, how he speaks and how he responds, he's steadfast, inshallah. Look at how powerful that understanding of Ibn Qayyim was from this ayah. He said, Allah is trying to tell you in this ayah that all of the shortcomings that you do, they come from either your feet and where they walk to. You walk, you hang around with some people that you shouldn't be hanging around to. You go, you want to go see a girl, you go hang around, you walk to the girl, it's haram you've done. You go to a club, you walk to the club. Does that make sense? So you walk to a place that's wrong. And not just that, when you get to the place, you speak. And what happens? You speak sin. 
He speaks sins. Does that make sense? A person gets into an argument with you, what do you do? You start talking, shouting, screaming, before you know, you've oppressed him now. You've insulted him, you've hurt him, you've, you, you might have even killed him. You might have even killed him. You know, the tongue, they say, is the greatest weapon in your life. It's the most dangerous weapon. It's very small. But like, because of it, entire countries will go to war. The tongue is very small. But because you might say one thing, and that one thing you say, because of it, two nations have gone to war. And bloodshed happened. Does that make sense? You see, your tongue, it, your, the words that you say, when they're inside of you, they are a prisoner inside of you. But when you speak and you utter your words and they come out, now you are a prisoner to your own words. Because because of something you say, you will end up in jail. Because of something you say, you will have to what? watch your back when you walk down the street. Because of something that you say, you lose your money, you lose your loved ones. So now you're a prisoner to that word. So hold that word. Be careful when you spread that word. Does that make sense? So Ibn Qayyim saying, slaves of Allah, fix your feet and where you walk. Be humble how you walk. Don't walk like you're arrogant. Only Allah is great. Only Allah is grand. Only Allah has the right to be proud. You, you know, one of the Salaf of Salih, he saw a man called Al Muhallab. He was walking. Al Muhallab was a king. Muhallab was a king. He saw him walking. And when he was walking, he was walking in a very arrogant way. So the Imam, he looked at him and he said, You see the way that you're walking? Allah hates it. Allah hates this kind of walk. Al Muhallab, because he was a king, he looked at him and said, Do you have any idea who you're talking to? Meaning, have you forgotten I'm the king? The Imam responded when he said, Do you have any idea who you're talking to? He said, I know exactly who you are. You're a man who started from seminal fluid. You came out of the womb of a woman. And your life is between you defecating and urinating and cleaning your own urine and your feces with your own bare hands. That's who you are. A vessel that carries feces and urine. And then with these same hands, you clean that feces in your urine. So don't think that you're someone who's great. Only Allah is great. So don't walk in that way. And number two, salama. Prophet, I really want to focus on this point here. If someone talks to you in a rude way, if someone insults you, if someone aggravates you, if someone provokes you, ignore them. Even if they are wrong. Even if they are wrong. Sometimes someone will come to you, you know, shout, spit in your face, be angry, disrespect you. So you say an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but let me make it equal. I want to mention to your poetry that a poet he mentioned. He says, he says, سامح ولا تستوفي حقك كله. He said, forgive. And don't try to seek all of your haq. Don't try to seek all of your rights. When someone violates you, he said, forgive. You might take one, two rights back. You violate me, I want my right back. But don't try to take all of your rights back. Why? وأبقي فلم يستوفي قط كريم. He said, let some of your rights remain with the person. Don't take back full revenge. Don't take back everything he took away from you. You know why? Because the generous person is worried that in me trying to take my rights back, I might take back more than he took from me. To get it equal. For example, someone punches you. Technically, does he have the right to get punched back? But if you hit him with force that was more than what he met you, you are now the oppressor. You are now the sinner. You are now the one who Allah is angry with. So it would have been better for you to say, you hit me, right? I leave it between you and Allah. On the day of judgment. Because Allah will justly give you your right back. Does that make sense? That's why a good friend of mine, he gave me a beautiful advice. He said, it's better to be the one who is oppressed than the one who oppresses. It's better to be the one who got oppressed than the one who done the oppression. Does that make sense? وَإِذَا خَاتَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلِ If the jahil speaks to you, who is a jahil? A jahil is a person who knows, sorry, who does not know, and he doesn't implement his knowledge. He doesn't have knowledge, so he doesn't implement knowledge. And even a person who has knowledge, but he doesn't implement it, is considered a jahil. Does that make sense? A girl who tells you, yo, what's going on? Is she arguing with you? Is she arguing with you? But is she a jahil? She's a jahil speaking to you. Oh, no, 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 you don't want to speak to that woman. Does that make sense, brothers? Wallahi, if you, when you leave your house, you safeguard your feet and you safeguard your tongue, inshallah ta'ala, a lot of khair will come to you that day. Does that make sense? A lot of khair will come to you that day. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentioned in another ayah, 
لمن عزم الأمور The one who is patient and he forgives That is from the great things من عزم الأمور The determined matters To be one who forgives Let the people off Does that make sense? And if a person deals with you in a bad way Allah tells you how to deal with them Allah said وَلَا تَسْتَوِ الْحَسَنَةُ وَالسَّيِّئَةُ That good and bad is not the same like if a person deals with you in a bad way, he violates you, harms you, he disrespects you. It's not, it's not, Allah knows it's not the same as good. He hasn't dealt with you in a good way. So what should you do? Allah said, إِدْفَعْ بِلَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ When he comes to you with evil, with disrespect, with rudeness, إِدْفَعْ بِلَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, respond to him, repel his evil, repel his evil with that which, that which is better. Someone says to you, hey, who are you talking to? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to speak, I didn't mean to upset you, my friend. And just respond with that which is better. Why? Because Allah said, فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةً The one who used to have enmity with, who's being evil to you, كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيُّ الْحَمِيمُ When you're kind to him, he can now become from a close, intimate companion with you. Zakhallah khair akhi. He can become a close, close friend. How many times have we seen it? That brothers, when they're on the road, they beef in each other. War in each other because of the gangs that they're in But when they come to the deed They're like best friends I actually know one brother like that One brother who's from an area He went to one area And the brothers what? They tried to actually kill him one time Now He came to the deed And one of the guys from that area Come to the deed They go and pray in the masjid together They wake each other up Hey bro let's go Let's go pray fetch together So But What did that come with? The brother who, who got attacked And he almost got killed When he saw the guy Who was from the gang That almost killed him he had to come to him on an aggy one. How are you doing, my brother? How are you doing? How are you doing? He responded to them with something that was better. So he became with him. They became like close best friends. And that's why the Prophet said, He said, When you love someone, love him moderately. Because it could be that tomorrow he becomes an enemy. And when you hate someone, hate them moderately. Because tomorrow he could become a close friend. And this is the problem with us. Well, like, when we love someone, we love them so hard that the day we meet them, we give them everything. All our deep, dark secrets. Tomorrow becomes the enemy exposing you. And even with women, by the way, a man gets married, he opens up to his wife, he tells her everything. Then when it doesn't work out, she divorces him, she puts it all online. She puts it all online. Let me tell you about this guy. And when you hate someone, hate them moderately. Some people, they hate someone, they give 100% to them. They, they live, breathe this guy's name. But then tomorrow you might need him You come back to him He helps you And you're like Oh he wasn't that bad actually So love and hate moderately Does that make sense? In other words Be careful where you walk And be careful how you talk Safeguard your legs Safeguard your tongue And inshallah ta'ala You will be from the slaves You will be on your way To being from The slaves of Ar-Rahman The second characteristic Allah Azza wa Jal That was the first The second one وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا They spend the night يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ just still standing in front of the Lord. Sujjatan in sajda. Wa qiyama, standing in salah. They stand the night praying to Allah Azza wa Jal. They stand the night doing what? Praying to Allah Azza wa Jal. Brothers, the second characteristic of Sayyidina Ar Rahman is that they are very close to their prayer. And praying at night, if you're praying the qiyamul layl, what benefit is there when you pray in the Qiyam al if you haven't prayed the daily prayers, right? The, the, the obligatory prayers throughout the day, the five obligatory prayers throughout the day and night. So of course those are first. But this person, he's built upon the obligatory prayers, he prays the sunnah at night time, sujjatan wa qiyama. Yabitunah, brother, he's there, like a house, just still, standing there. A house doesn't move, does it? A house stands still. Yabitun, he's there like a house, li rabbihim, towards his door, sujjatan wa qiyama. In sajda, standing, sajda, standing, praying to Allah, begging Him for His forgiveness and His mercy. Brothers, how is your qiyamul layl? When I ask the question, the sad reality is, the answer to that for most of us is, we don't pray qiyamul layl. We're missing out on this opportunity to be from the slaves of Ar-Rahman. You know, qiyamul layl, even if you, you, we all pray fajr, right? Because if you don't pray fajr, you're missing out on salah. Man tarakaha faqad kafar. Anyone who left the prayer, he left the fall in Islam. So we all Muslims, we all pray fajr. Akhi, how hard is it to wake up half an hour before Fajr? You're waking up for Fajr, but you're intentionally waking up late towards the sunrise time. So you don't even have time to pray Fajr, you just get Fajr in. 
wake up half an hour before Fajr. Pray one raka'ah witr. Just one raka'ah you pray to Qiyamul Layl. Is that hard to pray one? You know witr doesn't happen three. You can pray one. You know that, right? If you pray more, it's even better. You can pray Qiyamul Layl two, 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 and then last one, one. But if you just woke up and you prayed one raka'ah, Qiyamul Layl, Wallahi, you are from those who are praying Qiyamul Layl. And you can make dua at that time. It's a special time. Don't miss out that virtue from today. Oh, brothers, all you going to do that, inshallah ta'ala? Sisters, listen, everyone going to do that? Wake up half an hour, 45 minutes for Fajr, just 45 minutes. They're going to go back to sleep. Like most of you anyway, I know you are. People are going to go back to sleep after Fajr, right? Fajr is very early. So you're going to go back to sleep. The real men will start the day at Fajr and they'll keep it, they'll keep it strong. Right, Gulen? The real men will do that, inshallah ta'ala. But for those of us who are young boys, we'll go back to sleep after Fajr. Does that make sense? So when you do, it's, you haven't lost your sleep. Just, just, you're, instead of getting up at this time, where you only have a little bit of time to pray Fajr, you can't even pray Qiyamul Layl because Fajr is already Just rewind. Just stop. Just pray 45. Just wake up 45 minutes earlier. Pray one rak'ah, pray three rak'ah, and then go pray Fajr to your vicar and go to sleep. Does that make sense? Look at the virtues of Qiyamul Layl. The Prophet said, وَأَفْتَ لُصَّلَاتِ بَعْدِ الْفَرِيدَةِ صَلَاةُ الليل. The greatest, most virtuous prayer after the five obligatory prayers is the night prayer. رواه مسلم صحيح مسلم The Prophet said, Allah said in the Quran تتجافى جنوبهم عن المضاجع يدعون ربهم خوفا وطمعا The characteristic of the believers when they go to sleep they wake up they can't sleep they're scared they're scared of the hellfire they get up they say I have to pray يدعون ربهم they call out to the Lord خوفا out of fear طمعا hoping in Allah عز وجل his mercy Does that make sense? That's what the believers are like The Prophet said in another hadith he said عليكم بقيام الليل Upon you is Qiyamul Layl فَإِنَّهُ دَعْبُ الصَّالِحِينَ Because it's the re- action of the righteous people قَبَلَكُمْ before you Does that make sense? The Prophet said وَإِنَّ قِيَامِ اللَّيْلِ قُرْبَةٌ إِلَى اللَّهِ It's a way to get closer to Allah You want to be close to Allah, right? You don't want to be from those who are far from Allah You want to be distant from Allah? You can be close to Allah Close to Allah in this life Allah will make you close to Him in the next life وَإِنَّهُمْ وَإِنَّ قِيَامِ اللَّيْلِ قُرْبَةٌ إِلَى اللَّهِ And pay attention it's a way to protect yourself from sins. Qiyamul Layl protects you from sins. So you're wondering, why am I sinning? Because you have no connection with Allah. When you're connected to Allah, Allah saves you from sins. Does that make sense? What takfirun is It's the reason for your sins to be forgiven, your sins to be expiated. Allah is washing away your sins because of Qiyamul Layl. And look at this coronavirus. Everyone's scared, right? وَمَطْرَدَةٌ لِلْدَّاءِ عَنِ الْجَسَدِ And it places a barrier between you and sickness. Your body and sickness, it's a barrier. So look, Qiyam al what did, what did the Prophet said, say? عَلَيْكُمْ بِقِيَامِ الْلَيْلِ It's a bridge, it's not a bridge, but it's saying upon you is to do it. Why? Because number one, it's a righteous action. Number two, what is it? It's a way to get close to Allah. Number three, it protects you from sins. Number four, it deletes your sins that you've already done. Number five, Inshallah will protect you from coronavirus <laughs> and all other sins. Does that make sense? Alaykum bi qiyamil layl, as the Prophet said. And pay attention. The time when you pray qiyamul layl, and the best time to pray is the last third of the night. The last third of the night, so about two and a half hours or so before Fajr time, it changes because of the, uh, the winter and summer. You know, in, it's quite. The way to work it out basically is you look at the time Maghrib starts, you look at the time Fajr is. And divide that into three thirds. The last third is when is the best time to pray Qiyamul Layl. It's a special time. Look what happens at that time. The Prophet said, Yanzilu Rabb, Yanzilu wa Ta'ala kulla layla. Your, Our Lord, He descends. He descends every single night. Ila sama dunya to the sky of this world, to the heaven of this world. Allah He comes down Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Hina yabqa thuluthu layl. He does this when there is just one third of the night left. About two hours before Fajr time kicks in. ثلث الليل الأخير فيقول And then Allah he says من يدعوني Who is calling me? Who is making dua to me? فأستجيب له So that I can respond to him. Allah says who is calling me? I I'm going to answer him. وَمَنْ يَسْأَلُنِي Who is asking me? فَعُطِيَهُ So that I may give it to him. وَمَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُنِي And who is seeking forgiveness from me? 
فأغفر له so that I can forgive him. Allah, he was calls out every night same time but he has no response from us we're in bed so it's a time to make use of it's a time to it's a time to make use of does that make sense the third characteristic of the slaves of Ar-Rahman the third characteristic is that they are scared of the hellfire Allah said وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ They say Our Lord Divert from us Divert from us عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ The punishment of hellfire إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا Because its torment Is a painful 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 torment The hellfire is too painful Ya Allah so they make this du'a. Learn this du'a. From, okay? Everyone learns du'a. It's the end of Surah Al-Furqan. It's the end of Surah Al-Furqan. It's either on the last page or the page just before the last page. They say, Rabbana Nasrif. So this part of du'a. Rabbana Nasrif anna adab jahannam. Because Allah mentioned that this group of people, they make this du'a. It makes sense that you memorize this du'a today and every day you make it. In sajda you make it. In the tashahud just before you say salam you make it. Every time... You get a chance, make this dua, inshallah, you'll be from the slaves of Ar-Rahman. Because they're scared of the hellfire. They don't want to be thrown into it. إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا They say, evil indeed is hellfire. It is an abode and a place, evil, it's an evil place to be. It's an evil place to dwell in. Does that make sense? Being scared of the hellfire is very important. Okay? But, if I ask you right now, are you scared of the hellfire? Everyone will say yes. Brothers, very important point. Who has the right to be scared? I mean, whose fear is a good fear? Whose fear of the hellfire is a good fear? Because if I ask you right now, do you, are you scared of the hellfire? Everyone's going to say yes, right? Everyone's going to say yes. But like in... Not everyone's fear is a real fear. And the ones who have real fear are the ones who do good deeds and then they're scared. Because the person who's just scared of the hellfire and he hasn't got any good deeds, it's like, bro, you don't really, you're not really scared because if the person's really scared of the hellfire, he's doing good deeds to stay away from it. He's doing good deeds to stay away from it. Do you, do you understand the point? You can't say, Allah, I'm scared of hell. But then you're out there doing every single haram, taking drugs, listening to music, chatting to women, disrespecting your parents, missing prayers, not lowering your gaze, hanging around with the wrong people. You can't say to yourself, I am scared of the hell fire, but I do these things. A person who, because why? If you were truly scared, you would not do these things. Does that make sense? So that's why Allah Azza wa Jalla said, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَى Allah, he described the people who are going to come on the Day of Judgment. Allah said, they did what they did. They did what they did. وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَ And their hearts are in a state of fear. Their hearts are scared. Aisha radiallahu anha, when she heard this ayah, she said, أَهُمُ الَّذِينَ يَشْرَبُونَ الْخَمَرِ Because Allah said, they did what they did, and then they're scared. On the Day of Judgment. So Aisha, when she had, she said, Ahum al-Ladheena yashrabun al-Khamar Are these the ones who used to drink alcohol? Of course, by extension, take drugs. Wa Are they the ones who used to steal? Were they thieves? Were they muggers? The Prophet ﷺ said, La ya bint al-Siddiq. He said, Oh daughter of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. No. Wa al-Ladheena yasumun. Rather, these are people who, they used to fast. Wa yusallum. They used to pray. They used to give sadaqa. But they were scared that Allah would not accept their good deeds from them. They were scared Allah He might not accept this from them. They are the ones who used to do a lot of good. They would rush towards the good. Pay attention. These people, they've done righteous acts of worship. But the reason why they're scared is, Allah, did you accept it from me? If you didn't accept it, I might go hell. Please accept it from me, Ya Allah. Does that make sense? So it shows you, if you want to fear the hellfire, you have to come with acts of worship. You have to come with deeds. Does that make sense? And also make lots of du'a. Brothers, if, sisters, if you're scared of the hellfire, you have to make lots of du'a for it. You make du'a for everything. You ask for husband. Sisters, ask for husband. Inshallah, men, don't ask for no husband. 
They ask for a husband. Men, they ask for a wife, they ask for a job, you ask for this, you ask for that. They ask for protection from coronavirus, but not protection from the hellfire. The Prophet would make dua a lot. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannata wa ma qarraba ilayha min qawlin aw amal. Oh Allah, I ask you for al-jannah. And I ask you to... I ask you for actions and statements that will bring me closer to it. وَعُوذِ بِكَ مِنَ النَّارِ وَمَا قَرَّبَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ قَوْلٍ أَوْ عَمَلٍ And I seek refuge in you from the hellfire. And also actions and statements that are going to take me to the hellfire. You have to learn this dua, brothers and sisters. You have to learn this dua. I'll leave the page on the table so you can take a picture of it, inshallah ta'ala, if you want. Does that make sense? That's the characteristic of the people who are going to be what, inshallah ta'ala? Ibad al-Rahman. The fourth characteristic, inshallah ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal said they are people who give a lot of sadaqah. They give sadaqah, they spend, they give money in the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. They spend for the sake of Allah. Does that make sense? But when they spend, they spend with moderation. They're not stingy and they don't give away all their money so that now they are the ones who need charity. Does that make sense? Allah said, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِقُوا لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا Allah said, they are the ones who they spend. And when they spend, they're neither extravagant. Nor are they... They, they don't like give away everything they own. Hey, come live in my house. And then now he is the one that we have to give sadaqah to. Now we have to give zakat on him. Allah doesn't want you to give away everything so that now you become a broke, poor person. Does that make sense? That's not what the intention is here. Give, but you have to be able to have for yourself. But also not so stingy. No, no, don't spend so little that you're stingy. There's another ayah where Allah explains this very beautifully. Allah says, وَلَا تَجَعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكْ Do not make your hand as if it's tied to your neck. Like, I can't get it in my pocket. My hand's just stuck here. Like, I can't reach into my pocket. I'm sorry, I've got nothing to give. Okay? وَلَا تَبْسُطْهَا And don't open your hand. كُلَّ الْبَسْطِ Completely, does that make sense? فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْشُورًا such that you will become blameworthy and you will have severe poverty now. Because everyone took everything away from you. Just everyone is taken from you. Does that make sense? Spend. Spend. I can be moderate. And all ibadah is like this. Brothers, ghulu is bad. Extremism is bad. And extremism, extremism doesn't just mean to go overboard. It also means to fall short. Does that make sense? Like the one who prays four, he prays five rak'ah for fajr. He's an extremist. Look at Allah told you to pray two. Two for fajr. The one who doesn't pray Fajr at all is always an extremist because he came less. So extremism is to go overboard and to come short. And you want to make sure you're neither of them. Not in when you're spending and not in anything else. Does that make sense? Okay. Brothers, from the primary things that you must spend on is zakat. Is a zakat. Okay. And it's sad because we don't even know the ahkam of the zakat. There are things that we have. Some of you think it's just money. You might have things that zakat is due on and you don't even know. You have to study this. Does that make sense? You have to what? You have to study this. And when you give brothers, and when you give, well, like there's a disease that we all have, and that we don't give for the sake of Allah. And you know one of the things that shows that we don't give for the sake of Allah? Is that when you give, you remind people of that which you gave them. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la tubtilu sadaqatikum bil manni wal adha. Allah says, Oh you who believe, don't nullify your charity. By reminding people of the favor that you've done for them. Some brothers are like that. You know, they help you out one day. Every time they see you. Hey, how you doing bro? So remember that favor I done. Did it help you? Did it help you? That favor I done. Remember I did that for you that day. Brother had and you have a beef one day. I did this for you. I did that for you. Well that is so painful for the person. Like imagine you help someone in a difficult time. And then he comes and reminds you. Yeah bro that was me. That was me. Remember that. Don't forget that bro. Like the favor that you done for him now became a punishment for him. Does that make sense? And Allah said, لا تبتلو. Do not nullify your charity by reminding people of this. And some of us don't come and remind people, hey, remember when I done that good for you? But deep down, to show you, Wallahi, the affairs of the heart go deep, Wallahi. We're not conscious of our hearts and how filthy they are. We think, just because I didn't say to him that I did this for you, it means I must have done it for the sake of Allah. No. Sometimes it's deeper in your heart. Sometimes you do a favor for someone, and you expect them to be a certain way in return to you. Such that when they are not nice back to you, or they upset you one day, in your heart you think, or you might even say to others, but how are you doing that to me? Well, I was different that day, you know. Well, we all suffer from this disease. We all have filthy hearts. I'm not taking, I'm not short from this. We'll all we'll sit there and we'll say, what? 
like, well, I should have spoken to me like that. Why? He doesn't even remember what I did for him. So you don't say it to him, but you think it. And that shows you deep down in your heart, it wasn't really for Allah's sake. Because if it was for Allah's sake, you wouldn't care what you did for him. What you did for him, it doesn't even matter if you did it for him or not. The fact that he's being rude to you now. Because that was for Allah's sake. Rather, look how Allah describes in Surah Al-Insan, the people who give and they do it surely, purely for Allah's sake. يُوفُونَ بِالنَّذْرِ وَيَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا كَانَ شَرُّهُ مُسْتَطِيرًا They fulfill their what? Their vows. وَيَخَافُونَ They are scared. يَوْمًا كَانَ شَرُّهُ مُسْتَطِيرًا They are scared of the day of judgment. وَيُطْعِمُونَ وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا And they, they, they feed. They feed what? Food. What? To the one, even though they love the money. Even though they love the food, they have love for it. They need it themselves. They've got family, friends, this, that to feed. Like, and they spend to what? The miskeen, the one who's poor, the yatim, the orphan, the asir, the captive, they spend on them. And when the person turns around and he says, Thank you. They say, They say, We only gave you this food because we wanted to see the face of Allah. Don't say thank you. Don't give me jaza, don't give me a reward, don't pay me back. Don't do a favor in return to me. Don't even say thank you. They say, نَخَافُ بِالرَّبِّنَا يَوْمًا We are scared from our Lord a day. حَبُوسًا قَمْبَرِيرًا The faces are going to be darkened on that day. That's what we're scared of. That's why we're giving you this. We give sadaqah for ourselves. So when you give charity, when you help someone, when you do a favor from someone, never think, I'm doing this favor to help them. You're doing this favor to help yourself. If you do it truly, for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Does that make sense? The fifth characteristic of the slaves are Rahman is that they stay away from the three greatest evils. Shit, number one, which is kufr. Number two, which is murdering an innocent soul. And number three, zina, fornicating. Sleeping around with someone who is not halal for you. Someone you're not married to. Look what Allah said. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٍ Allah said, my slaves, my slaves, the slaves of Ar-Rahman that Allah just described, they are the ones, they do not make dua to any other God besides Allah. وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ And they do not take the life of any soul unjustly. وَلَا يَزْنُونَ And they do not fornicate, they do not commit adultery. They don't engage in intimacy and intercourse outside of marriage. وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا Whoever does that, he's going to meet his punishment, Allah said. And what happens? يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ On the day of judgment, his punishment is going to be doubled for him. وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا And he will abide in there in disgrace. Humiliated. Does that make sense? I want to talk to you about these three evils. Brothers, shirk is very, very dangerous. Stay away from it. Shirk is the one thing, if there was anything that you should be making dua, Allah protects you from every day, is shirk. Because Allah said in the Quran, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارُ مَا لِلْظَالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ Allah Azza wa Jalla said, anyone who came with shirk, Allah made jannah haram for that person. The same was haram for you to do, zina, now, jannah became haram for you to enter if you came with shirk. Another ayah Allah said, Allah, uh, uh, Allah, Allah, he does not forgive the one who does shirk. But the one who does less than shirk, he may forgive it if he wishes to. Does that make sense? The second thing, I want to talk about killing for a second because killing has become something that's very light and very easy for us to do. How big is it to actually kill someone? Brothers, when you hear this, sisters, when you hear this, go and spread this to your family and friends. And tell them to carry on spreading this because when the Prophet ﷺ talked about the evil of killing and the evil and the, and the, and the danger of killing in the khutbah al wada'a, Allah, the Prophet said at the end, he said, now the one who's here, go and tell the one who's absent. The one who's present, let him inform the one who's absent. So when you hear about the dangers and the evils of killing and murder and spilling blood, you should go and talk about it to people because of how big it is. People take killing very lightly. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ He said, I swear by the one in whose hands is my soul. لَقَتْلُ مُؤْمِنٍ أَعْدَمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ زَوَالِ الدُّنْيَا To kill a believer is greater to Allah than the entire world to go. The Prophet said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul. It would have been enough for the Prophet to just say it. He didn't have to take an oath. But he took it just to show you how important this matter is. How serious it is. That for a believer to get killed is greater for Allah. It's worse for Allah than the whole world to be destroyed. 
<coughs> if the whole world was to be destroyed, it would be better for them a believer to be cured. Does that make sense? In other hadith, the Prophet sallam, لَمَّا نَظَرَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَيْسَمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَةِ One day the Prophet sallam, he looked at the Kaaba, قَالْ مَا أَعْذَمُ حُرْمَتَكْ What is most sacred than you, O Kaaba? The house of Allah, that Ibrahim built, that every Prophet came and then hajj to, that we have to go to hajj. That house, مَا أَعْذَمُ حُرْمَتَكْ What is more sacred than you, O Kaaba? قَالْ He said, what is more honorable than you? قَالْ What did the Prophet say? وَلِلْمُؤْمِن he said, the believer, he is more sacred. To, he's looking at the Kaaba, he's talking at the he's looking, talking at the Kaaba and talking. The believer is more sacred to Allah than you. Allah made for you one sanctity, one sacredness. But Allah made three things sacred for the Muslim. Damuhu, his blood. Wamaluhu, his wealth. And what? And that you don't have bad and evil assumption about him. His, his honor. You don't disrespect him. You don't belittle him. You don't humiliate him. Don't disgrace him. So don't harm a Muslim to do it. Well, I ask a person, you go and slap a believer, you slap a Muslim, you insult a Muslim, you cuss a Muslim. Will you go and insult the Kaaba? Will you go and say to the Kaaba and say, insult the Kaaba? You wouldn't, would you? Why would you insult a Muslim? When the Muslim is more valuable to you than the Ka- to Allah than the Kaaba. Does that make sense? The Muslim is... Would you go and steal the Kaaba? Would you... Someone... One kind of evil person will go to Mecca and he's still a brick from the Kaaba who steal the black stone. He actually plotted to steal the black stone. You think, what kind of shaitan is this? But then you go and steal from a Muslim. And a Muslim is more... His wealth is more sacred to Allah than the Kaaba. And you spill the blood of a Muslim and his blood is more beloved to Allah, more sacred to Allah than the Kaaba. Does that make sense? The Prophet ﷺ said, وَيُجِيءُ الرَّجُلُ on the day of judgment, a man will come and will be holding on to the hand of another man. فيقول, he will say, Inna hadha qatalani. He will say, Allah, this man, he killed me. He killed me. فيقول الله, Allah will say lahu to him. What will he say? Lima qatalta. Why did you kill this man? فيقول, he will say, لِتَكُونَ الْعِزَّةُ لِفُلَانٍ فَيَقُولُ لِتَكُونَ الْعِزَّةُ لِفُلَانٍ he would say, I killed him out of honor, out of respect for so-and-so. For example, you killed someone because they violated one of your family members. You killed someone because they disrespected your gang. You killed someone because of your area. You killed someone because of your locality. You killed someone because, of, because out of respect for someone else. And Allah will say, إِنَّهَا لَيْسَتْ لِفُلَانٍ Allah said, honor is not for this person. Honor is not for your gang. Honor is not for your country. Honor is not for your family. Honor is not for the reason why you killed this person. Because honor is for Allah. And, Allah, and, and the Prophet said that the person will carry the burden of his sin. The person will carry the burden of his sin. And what is the sin of a person who murders? Look at how Allah described the punishment of the one who murdered a believer in the Quran. Allah said, Anyone who killed a believer intentionally, then he has five punishments. He will be entered inside of the hellfire. One, count with me. Khalidan fiha. Eternity he will spend inside the hellfire. Wa ghadib Allahu alayhi. Allah is angry with him. Wa la'anahu. Allah curses him. Wa addalahu adaban azima. And Allah has prepared for him a mighty punishment. Five things Allah said. Even Allah did not describe shirk being punished in this way. Even though shirk is worse. And the punishment for shirk is worse. Like in Allah did not even describe the punishment of shirk in the Quran the way he described the punishment of killing a believer. And even if you kill a non Muslim, in another ayah, Allah said, it's as if you took the whole life of all of humanity because you took the life of any soul. Does that make sense? Killing a person is something you will have to answer for on the day of judgment. You will have to answer for it, brothers and sisters. You can repent to Allah all you want. You can give blood money. But your repentance is, is causing you to be forgiven between you and Allah. And if you get killed by the government... Islamic court If the judge sentences you to death Or the family forgives you So that you pay blood money That's only for the family To find ease and peace But for the guy that you killed He will be waiting On the day of judgment for you He will be waiting On the day of judgment Saying I want my rights And imagine You will have to give him Your good deeds Or carry his sin Imagine how many good deeds Will be worth a life When the Kaaba Is less valuable Than the life of a believer 
you would have to do deeds that are the value is going to have to be very high. Does that make sense? And if a person has, by any chance, who's here, and inshallah, no one here, but someone watching online who might have murdered someone, then they should fast a lot, because the fasting is one action that if a person asks you for it on the day of judgment to give, it will not be given, because the Prophet said that Allah said that fasting for inna huli is for me. And I reward it. So the scholar said, if you oppress someone through backbiting, murder, stealing from them, or whatever it is that you've done, when they start taking your good deeds away from you, if you fasted a lot, the fasting is one thing that it will not be given because the fasting is private between you and Allah. All day you're fasting, no one knows except for Allah. It's an act of worship that you do, no one knows except for Allah. So it's between you and Allah. So Allah will say, I'm not going to give his fasting away. No, you can take the prayers, you can take his charity, you can take all of his good deeds, but you can't take the fasting. And knowing that because Allah said, and I reward for it myself, Allah never specified the reward, which means the reward is massive. It can't be counted. So then the scholar said, Allah will withhold it for the believer, as in it wouldn't be given away, and then Allah will start to expand it and multiply it for the believer. So if you oppress someone, maybe the person you oppressed, he's dead now, and you know he's going to ask you for good deeds. Obviously give charity for them, and make dua for them, do all of that, but fast a lot as well. Make lots of du'a for them Because on the day of judgment That du'a will benefit you When they say I, I need my rights Yeah yeah look I made a mountain I made mountains of du'a for you Here you go Take it say, Alhamdulillah Thank you Let me keep moving but Fasting is very important Does that make sense? And the third thing Brothers and sisters Is uh, zina Allah said They don't commit zina I don't know what happened to us Wallahi That zina became so light for us Look what the Prophet said When a person is sleeping with someone that they're not married to They don't have nikah with He is not a believer at that time He is not a believer Another narration, another wording It said When a slave is engaged in this act Of sleeping with someone that they're not married to خَرَجَ مِنْهُ iman. The iman comes outside of his body. فَكَانَ فَوْقَ رَأْسِهِ كَظُلَّ And it is above his head as if it's a shade. You know like the way a shade is on top of your head. It comes over your head. فَإِذَا خَرَجَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ الْعَمَلِ عَادَ إِلَيْهِ الْإِيمَانِ The moment he stops doing that evil, the iman comes back inside of him. It's so filthy that the iman in your body refuses to be inside of you when you do that act. Imagine you were to die whilst doing zina and the iman is outside your body what would happen to you? And now we're complaining about coronavirus, coronavirus Brothers I beg you pay attention to what I'm about to say to you Allah knows best but this punishment this seems as if it's an adab from Allah Plagues are a punishment from Allah and the scholars have mentioned this is a plague so we Assume and deduce from this This is a plague And look at what the Prophet said لا تظهر الفاحشة في قوم قد That sexual deviancy and promiscuity Does not become apparent Inside of a people And to the point where they now do it publicly Accept that what فَشَا فِيهِ مُطَّعُونَ Allah said the plague to them Illnesses and diseases, the likes of which have never been heard before. They had AIDS first. And then they what? They didn't wake up. Had anyone had AIDS before? And it was spreading. Back in the 1980s, AIDS was spreading. There's countries where you can't go like, 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 like half the people got AIDS. AIDS was spreading. But then they what? They gave all this medication for AIDS and then they started introducing condoms. So they thought, you know what, we can fight against the, the punishment of Allah. They thought, what? They thought, what? We can what? We're going to wear condoms. So what, we're going to deflect ourselves against the punishment of Allah. So Allah said, no problem, I'll send you a disease that will enter you when you kiss the girl, when you shake the hand of the girl. Just touch the girl. And nowadays, they don't just touch boys and they're gay. So a man touch a man. A man kiss a man. A man shake another man's hand. Does that make sense? A woman shakes another woman's hand, she's a lesbian. Now what? Just by them touching. Now, what? I'm like, this, no, no, and they still haven't woken up. 
and you have to be scared of something, brothers. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, you have to be scared of something. Allah said, وَاتَّقُوا fitna, Fear the fitna. Which one? The one that when it strikes, it doesn't just take the bad people. It takes everyone. The Prophet says, this is why he said, you will strike the hand of the dim-witted one. When you see someone doing evil, grab his hands. What are you doing? Why are you doing this evil? Because if you don't, Allah will destroy all of you. Another hadith, the Prophet said, what? That you will command good and you will forbid evil. If you don't, Allah will send upon you a punishment. You will raise your hands to beg Allah to uplift it from you and Allah will not remove it from you. Why? Because you never forbid the evil. Well, I'd be very scared right now, brothers and sisters. They say that the UK in two to four weeks is going to become like Italy. The whole country is locked down because of the coronavirus. Allah has sent an enemy to these people that they can't even see. Because of it, it has closed down airports, closed down seaports. All of it is closed down. All of it is closed down. And they're all panicking. And the only way they can do all the vaccinations, whatever they want, they can do whatever they want. The only you, you cannot deflect Allah's punishment with medicine. You only deflect Allah's punishment with toba. With toba. Allah forgive me. Does that make sense? And that's why the last part of the ayah where Allah mentioned they don't do shirk, they don't murder, they don't do zina. What was the last thing Allah mentioned? If they do do it, because Allah knows people fall into sins, they make tawbah. Allah said, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ He repents. وَآمَنَ He believes. وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا He starts to do righteous actions. What did Allah say? يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ All of the evil that he or she done, Allah will convert it, exchange it, and turn it into hasanat, good deeds. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ رَحِيمًا Allah is forgiving and he's merciful. سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَ بِحَمْدِكَ شَبْنُ لَا إِلَا إِلَا أَنْسْتَغْفِرُ وَتُوبُ لَيْكَ السلام عليكم guys. We believe that everyone should have access to the obligatory things that they need to know, the obligatory knowledge that they need to know in order to be a Muslim on and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to at least a basic level. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Talab al-ilm faridatun ala kulli muslimin. Seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every single Muslim. In other words, it means if you're not seeking that obligatory knowledge that you need, that minimum knowledge that you need, then you and I could actually be sinning. In fact, we would be sinners by not, by not seeking that knowledge. But alhamdulillah, in order to solve that problem, we put together something called the Knowledge College. The Knowledge College is an online Islamic studies institute where we teach you how to study your religion. Brothers and sisters, you can start studying it right now by going to the link below, checking out the website, and hopefully if you like what you see, you can register inshallah ta'ala and start your pursuit of seeking knowledge. We start on a basic level and then alhamdulillah, we work our way up to the top. Let's do that together inshallah. Check out the link below, Knowledge College. See you there. Assalamu alaikum.